Most of you know me. My name is Bob Stabatino. I am a surviving Lyme patient and advocate. I started Lyme Society a couple of years ago in the need of bringing more education and advocacy to Staten Island. Uh, I would like to first thank our speakers that will be here today, Pat Smith, Kenneth Liegner, Brian Fallon, and Bob Bransfield, and uh, for helping out Dr. Ernest Visconti. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors that helped us put this event on, uh, the Nicotra Group, which is the, the group that owns this place, uh, Nutramedics, LDA, and Alfonso's Pastries. Uh, we are in a very good time right now with Lyme. Education is coming around and it's coming forward. There's a lot of information out there and it hasn't always gotten full stream. A lot of us in the community are trying to change that. There's a big, there's a large group of people that care a lot about moving forward as patients. Uh, myself being one of them, being a member of uh, Lyme Society, an affiliate partner of Lyme Disease Association, uh, and now a voting member of the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group for Health and Human Services. Uh, also, as a disclaimer, my opinions do not show as the opinions of that group. Uh, they're just my own. Uh, we want to bring this all to you. And with that being said, we'll bring up our first speaker to start the day, Dr. Brian Fallon. Good morning. Okay, everybody's awake. Okay, so I'm going to, thanks Bob for inviting me, and um, I'm going to be talking about the uh, exciting science that's happening, and I'm going to try to make it as understandable as possible. Um, and there is a lot of good stuff happening, as, as Bob said. So what's on this slide here? You see the ticks burrowing into the skin, you see the spirochetes in the middle? And what's that on the right? Those are the mouth parts of a tick. And you never would have imagined that they're colored so beautifully. And that's because they're not colored that way. It's a scientist at the, somewhere in the government who decided to digitally color the <laughs> mouth parts of the spirochete. But he did a great, or he, she did a great job, whoever did it, it's beautiful. So we have a book that uh, just came out called Chronic Conquering Lyme Disease, and, the, and Jennifer Sotsky was a medical student who spent a summer with me, and I tried to get her off my back by telling her to download stuff from the internet on my, from my website, put it into a book format, and I thought she'd leave me alone for the summer, uh, but she didn't. She kept coming back every three months for the next two years, and she made me feel guilty because I hadn't done any work on it. And uh, so then I finally did some work on it and added all the latest new scientific stuff that we've learned and that I've learned, partly as a result of co-organizing co the National Lyme Disease Association conference that Columbia and I share with Pat Smith. Um, and that has been a wonderful venue for bringing together the latest research scientists to share their knowledge. And what I didn't realize when we were organizing that was that it also brings the researchers together, and so they start collaborating and doing great things. So it's been, um, so part of what I'm going to share is scientists who came to the field as a result of that conference, actually. It's not here, but you can get it on Amazon, and uh, if you order it from Columbia Press, uh, and type in uh, CUP30 for the uh, re uh, reduction code, you get 30% uh, off. It's $30 with Amazon, $20 from Columbia Press. Cup 30 is the code. So why did we do that? It's because the patients were climbing to the mountaintops and saying, we have Lyme disease and we need help, please. This is David Skidmore's cartoon. Now, David Skidmore is a wonderful cartoonist and he's really, he had Lyme disease and he's really mad about it. <clears throat> and so he also did this cartoon showing the balance of the doctors and the academics weighing so heavily. I'm gonna hold it. 
weighing so heavily on the issue of chronic Lyme disease uh, and saying that it doesn't exist. And so there, for a long time, the feeling was uh, doctors and academics were not paying attention to this disease and saying it really just didn't happen and people are making it up. And the ticks, as we all know, are a problem. So here are ticks at Christmas time uh, saying their blessings and saying, uh, bless us, Bob, for, I can't even read it because I don't have my glasses on, for thy bounty, which we are about to receive from Bob. Um, so I love that one. Okay, so I, I've been thinking about <coughs> Lyme disease for a long time, and I divide it into three eras. The era is from 1970 six to 1990, which was a time of great openness and discovery. It's when they first realized in the mid-70s that this problem existed, and they were so excited to um, <clears throat> be able to help patients, but also to describe a new disease. So they were really careful in the way they, they described the cases, and they wrote these beautiful case reports. So when I'm teaching the medical students or the fellows who come in, I have them read some of those early case reports because it's so rich. And then in 1990, the CDC recognized that there's this epidemic that's going on and we need to really count very carefully the number of cases. So they created these very objective criteria that could focus on what you could see, like the big swollen joint or the, or the facial palsy or the meningitis with abnormalities in the spinal fluid or the carditis. Um, but those are things you can document objectively and, and that's good because you need to be able to monitor the disease over time. So that's what the CDC did. Problem was that clinicians then started to say to themselves, well, if this is what the CDC are using for their criteria, that's what I'm gonna use for my criteria for diagnosis. And all of a sudden what happened is all these people who previously had been treated because people were open about what Lyme disease might cause, suddenly said, oh, you don't meet the criteria for what the CDC is defining, therefore you can't get the antibiotic treatment. And so the poor patients were left hurt by the doctor who they knew and loved, who'd taken care of them for so many years, and now saying, well, I don't know what you have and I'm not going to treat you. Or they do treat them and the patient gets better but then three months later, the patient relapses with the same symptoms. And then the patient says, well, what do I do now? Go looks back to the doctor and the doctor sometimes said, well, I'm not going to retreat you because the uh, teaching is that three weeks is curative and anything else is something else. Um, so as you can imagine, it created rage. Patients got really angry and they organized and they formed foundations and associations, Pat Smith being one of the organizers, the Lyme disease, founder of the Lyme Disease Association. And, and that rage, if channeled well, can cause major progress, and it did. I'll talk about that in a bit. And then in 2008, it was a time of great new openness. And why all of a sudden would academics beco become open? Why, these entrenched, rigid people? And it's because of science. So there were some scientific studies that started to get published that suddenly rocked the foundation of the academic community. And they realized that, wow, we need to start taking a, paying attention to what the patients are saying. That in fact, in the animal model, it was shown that there, after antibiotic treatment, the spirochetes seemed to persist. And that was shown in the mouse model then in the monkey model, and then in dogs, beagles, actually was shown 10 years earlier, but nobody paid attention because they didn't believe it was possible, so they thought it must be a flawed study, even though it got published in a good journal, so for 10 years, the academics still ignored it until finally, one of the leaders of the field, Dr. Uh, Stephen Bartold at UC Davis, um, who's one of the pioneers in Lyme disease research, published an article where he was reporting the same thing in the mouse, that the spirochetes uh, can persist. So here's a visual of the history of Lyme disease, and it doesn't start in 1976. It starts way back in 3000 BCE when uh, this 5,000-year-old man was discovered in the ice and shown to have Borrelia spirochetes. And then uh, I won't go through this in tremendous detail, uh, just to say the spirochete was identified in 1982. Then the CDC came out with their criteria in the early 90s. And then the Borrelia genome was sequenced. That's the spirochete that causes Lyme disease. That's Borrelia. And why is that important? It's important because if we don't know what the makeup is of the bug, 
We're not going to be able to, to develop good diagnostic tests. We're not going to be able to develop novel treatment ideas. We're not going to be able to develop good vaccines. So that was a major step forward. And then we had a vaccine that came out that was only on the market for four years, and everybody was hopeful about the vaccine initially, and a lot of money went into um, developing that vaccine. It was a very clever vaccine, but there was concern about a rise of arthritis and neuropathies after the vaccine, and some evidence supporting that, indicating that maybe that was due to the vaccine. And that's still a controversial area, but the interest in the vaccine dropped, so they stopped uh, making it. And then we had some of the clinical trials, which I can talk about a little bit later. And there was that beautiful mouse, and then the rhesus macaque monkey, and that's where persistent infection was shown after antibiotic treatment. And you know, that's lousy news that the spirochete persists after antibiotic treatment. That's not good news. But actually it was good news because then we, now we have an animal model where we can study it, and it gives credibility to what the patients were saying for a long time. And so that's actually very exciting. Uh, that they were able to show that. And then with all the, the, the uh, box there with all the numbers, systems biology and the omics revolution, that's really revolutionized all of medicine in the last 10 years. And it's basically due to massive computational power that computers have allowed and facilitated. Uh, machine learning where you can solve puzzles through all these different a algorithms that the brilliant uh, statisticians are, have created. Uh, and, and also the, all the uh, gene study, ways of studying what, what the genes produce. And then another piece of bad news was that there were 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease each year, but that was good news because it, it meant everybody realized that this is a huge epidemic that we need to focus on, and also that they could make money if they developed a really great new test. So when there's a financial incentive, that helps. So here's just some of the organizations that have developed over the years to, because of mothers really, and parents and fathers and families uh, who, have, who have struggled and, and done great things. Um, okay, so what are the major shifts of the last decade? One, the recognition that Lyme disease is not simple. It used to be said that Lyme disease is such a simple disease, you get a rash, you treat it, it's gone, that's it. So why are you complaining? Well, it, it, it's not a simple disease. The current blood tests are actually not adequate. So early, everybody acknowledges that early in infection, only 35 to 50 percent of the time will it detect a positive result. So that's lousy, right? And how can it be that we can send people up to the moon, but we can't get a better diagnostic for Lyme disease? That doesn't make any sense. And the truth is, there are a tremendous number of new tests coming down the pike, and some, some are actually available now, so that's a good thing. I talked about how spirochetes can persist. There's actually also lots of evidence now that people with chronic symptoms after Lyme disease, uh, you can find some things uh, in their blood, sometimes in their spinal fluid, sometimes on brain imaging, that confirms that there's something going on that we need to understand better. And uh, so the more that you can have objective markers, either of the immune system or of proteins, the more that's going to lead to uh, better, better treatments and tests. Another thing that's happened is the discovery of new microbes in the ticks. Now, that's, this, it's not great news to have new microbes. We have enough problems with the ticks without discovering new microbes. But, but that actually also has been helpful because there are patients out there, for example, who test negative on the Lyme tests but they do have Lyme-like symptoms. So why would that be? Could be that the tests are lousy, or it could be that they don't have Lyme disease, but they have a Lyme-like disease. And so one example of that is Borrelia miyamotoi, which is a Lyme-like disease that is found in a certain percentage of the ticks, maybe 10 or 15 percent of the ticks, uh, or 10 percent of ticks are infected with Borrelia miyamotoi in certain places. And in my work up at Columbia, where we have people coming for a second or third opinion, we routinely now do the Borrelia miyamotoi test because we're finding it, uh, or markers of that, of that infection. And that could be helpful for the per person, as I said, who tests negative on a, a Lyme test. So then we can say, wow, here's confirmation that you have been infected by an organism that's called Borrelia miyamotoi, 
Fortunately, the treatment, as far as we know, is the same as Lyme disease, mm -hmm. and you can get better. <coughs> and then there's recognition that the brain has something to do with persistent symptoms. And why does the brain have anything to do with persistent symptoms? I'm sure Bob will be talking about that. Um, but um, brain imaging studies support that. And, and, the, and the, the one thing I like to explain to patients is that the pathways that cover pain also are similar to the pathways that govern mood. So if you are depressed, your pain is going to be increased. If you're in pain, you're going to be more depressed. And everybody knows that. Uh, but it's actually partly because those pathways are the same in the brain. So if you can correct the pain pathways or the, or the mood pathways, you'll help the other symptom complex. So this is astonishing to me. It still astonishes me. Uh, 1999 was to 2003 was the, the uh, big genome, human genome project. And they wanted to sequence one human genome. And how much did that cost? up to a billion dollars to do that. And it took them four years of intensive effort with people working all around the globe to, to address different pieces of the problem. And finally, they came up to this human genome. Then in 2006, how much did it cost? $14 million. Big improvement. And now, how much does it cost? About $1,000. What used to take four years, now takes about two days. That's astonishing. And it's so astonishing, uh, the speed and the inexpensiveness of it uh, means that scientists can now use gene sequencing in cancer research, immunologic research, Lyme disease research to identify all the microbes that are inside a piece of tissue or in fluid uh, to, ins to find out exactly what is going on in your blood or, or your immune system or your spinal fluid that might be uh, causing disease. I love, work, I love meeting these researchers because they're so smart and they're so passionate about what they're doing and they're uh, focusing a lot of their energies on Lyme disease. So this is the era of personalized medicine, which basically means that we study you as an individual find out what's going on with you and look at your genetics and uh, we'll get to that. We're not quite there yet for Lyme disease, but uh, find out what the host interaction is, meaning your interaction, what you bring to the picture, and then this, why do some people get bad Lyme disease and others don't, right? It must have something to do either with the strain of the spirochete that's infecting you or something to do with your, whole, your response because of your genetics. I love images, I like pictures, so here are some pictures. Uh, and all these beautiful creatures here, the Borrelia spirochetes have been shown to persist in these animals despite antibiotics, but oftentimes they persist without any disease. So why is it that the mice who carry all of these spirochetes don't get disease? How does that happen? How does the spirochetes do that? And it's because, so in order to survive, the spirochetes have genetically evolved to evade the immune response, which means that they, in order to survive, they need to not be killed by the mouse's immune response. So that's how they survive. So it shouldn't be so surprising that they can survive. Uh, it's a tricky organism, is, is really the story. So here's the picture of spirochetes that are visualized within tissue of a mouse at one year after antibiotic treatment. There's that beautiful rhesus macaque. And this, uh, Monica Embers is this brilliant um, researcher at Tulane University who has been studying the rhesus macaque for quite a while and showing, showing that the Borrelia spirochetes can persist. And she's actually now studied, this is very exciting, she's studied the uh, blood test response uh, in the monkey after antibiotic treatment with the persistent bug. And what she's found is that there are certain markers uh, that the spirochete has later in infection that's not there early in infection. And so the typical anti uh, antibody-based test that we use will t become negative, like one of my, the one that I seem to like a lot is the C6 peptide ELISA, but it becomes negative even in some of those monkeys that still have infection. So she's developed some assays that 
contain the markers for that late infection disease, infection. So that's exciting. And then the human xenodiagnostic study was to take ticks and have them feed on previously treated humans with persistent symptoms. And in this one study, they were able to detect uh, the DNA of the Lyme spirochete in one of the previously uh, treated Lyme disease patients. So just, this is just one boring slide to explain the importance between, uh, of indirect detection versus direct detection. So wouldn't it be great if we had a test that could tell you that you had active infection? We don't have that. We don't really have a good test yet. So all we have are these antibody-based tests, the IFA, the ELISA, the Western blot, and that just tells you what, that you had infection at some point, could have been five years ago, so I have patients come to see me and they say, I have Lyme disease because I have a positive IgG Western blot and I've already finished a year of antibiotics or three months of antibiotics or one week of antibiotics. My test is still positive. That means I'm still infected. And the answer is no, that's not at all the case because these antibodies can stay positive for many years, even after it's, the spirochete is gone. And I remember the first fully positive Lyme test I ever saw was in a... Uh, my, my research assistant, who was totally healthy, and uh, I, I, I needed blood for my healthy control. So I took his blood, sent it off for Western blot testing, and he had like six bands on his IgG Western blots. So I, I said, how did this happen? Dan, where, when did you get Lyme disease? And he said, I never had Lyme disease. And I said, oh, come on, don't you remember a, a bad flu-like illness or a rash or swollen joints? Nope, don't recall any of that. So his, his body fought it off. Uh, and generated, like a vaccine, a good antibody response uh, that's circulating around and hopefully keeping him protected in some ways from some strains of the Borrelia. Okay, I'm not going to torture you with the host response, but I just want you to get the concept, which is that when the spirochete comes into your body, your body tries to fight it off, right? So it generates an immune response. It also perturbs the system. So it changes the balance of sugars and lipids and other things in your blood. And so what researchers are now doing around the country are studying what's called the host response. So can you get a biosignature, a, a signature of those changed lipids and proteins in the blood? That's called a metabolomics profile. Can you get a protein a signature? That's called a proteomics profile. Can you get a messenger RNA signature? That's called a transcriptome profile. And what's really cool is that this stuff is actually happening. So if you look in the blood for the spirochete, you can't find it. Why? Why can't you find it? What? It's hiding. It, well, it doesn't hang out in the blood. It just goes, it, it disappears from the blood very quickly, and it goes into the tissues. So it's logical that if you do a blood test looking for the spirochete, you're not going to find it. So you have to use the indirect ways to try to find it. So that's why these other ways are so important. And hopefully, they would become negative when the spirochete is no longer in your system. That's the hope. And some people are developing tests that look at protein remnants of the spirochete. So there is a, something called a Lyme urine nanotrap test, which uses very sophisticated nanotechnology to detect tiny little amounts of the protein of the spirochete in the urine. And that looks like a very interesting test that actually is available from, from Georgia, which I don't really know well enough to speak about as to how good I think it is, but uh, it is available. So I talked about how exciting the genetic sequencing is and how rapid it is. And you know, what did, what did I learn when I was in medical school and all doctors still know, which is that when you're evaluating a patient, you, do your, you make your hypotheses, right? What does this person have? Someone comes in with trouble breathing and they have a pneumonia. Well, what is the likely cause of the pneumonia? So you go through this whole differential. Or someone has fever. What's the li likely cause of this fever? So then you order a blood test to try to confirm what you think the cause is. And if you're lucky, it'll come back positive. But about, what, 20% of the time with fevers of unknown origin, we still don't know what it is. Or with pneumonias, 40% of the time, we still don't know what the cause of the pneumonia is. With, and with um, 
Encephalitis, it may be only maybe 60 or 70 percent of the time. We don't know what the cause is. That stinks. For modern science, that stinks. So that's called a fishing pole approach to diagnostics, which means I think I know the fish that I'm going to catch, and I'm going to put the right bait on, and out comes the fish, and I got a correct diagnosis. That's the fishing pole approach. The better approach is the wide net approach, where you pull out every fish that's in that pond and then identify what the fish are. So that's what metagenomic sequencing does. It allows you to take all, of, all the microbes that are in the blood or the spinal fluid and in a short period of time, you don't have to wait for culture, find out what's in that fluid. And so within 48 hours, you can get a diagnosis. So here's a story. Uh, of a young man treated by Charles Chu, who's developed this metagenomic sequencing at UCSF. And he was admitted to the emergency room in status epilepticus, meaning that his, he had chronic refractory seizures. Nothing to do with Lyme, but he had chronic refractory seizures. And this had been going on for a long time. Uh, he had had three hospitalizations over the prior four months, 44 days in the ICU. He had 100, over 100 inconclusive tests. And when he got admitted to UCSF, they did a spinal tap. He had a brain biopsy. He was in an induced coma to try to keep him safe from the refractory seizures. So they did a spinal tap. They sent the fluid up to Charles Chu's lab. And in 48 hours, they were able to identify the organism as this Leptospira Santa Rosae, which is only located in three places around the world. One of those places happens to be Puerto Rico, and he and his family had visited Puerto Rico a year earlier, and he had been a little bit sick and had been simmering in his system, and then it's sort of flowered, but the good news is that it's treatable. So within two or three weeks, uh, he was out of the hospital, and uh, seizures are all gone, and, and had done remarkably well. So that, is a, that was actually on the front page of the New York Times in 2014 because it was such an incredible case, but it documents, most importantly, the power of modern uh, medicine to detect things in a revolutionary new way, including tick-borne diseases. So that was the genome sequencing. That was genome sequencing that allowed you to do that in a super fast way. Another approach, which I didn't mention yet, is that you take the blood from the person, and uh, the blood contains all these cells, including T cells, and if those T cells have recently seen the Lyme spirochete, then those T cells will be really mad at having seen the Lyme spirochete, and they'll have uh, all these cytokines that respond at the next vision of the spirochete. So what they do in the lab is they expose those T cells to a little bit of a fragment of the protein of the spirochete, and if that T cell had previously seen the spirochete, it generates a much more robust cytokine response or inflammatory response than if it hadn't previously seen the spirochete. This is a test that they use in TB, and now they're trying to adapt it for the use of in Lyme disease. And what's really cool is that they're working on it, and here was a paper in 2016 that was published. So instead of 35 to 50 percent sensitive, this was 69 percent sensitive, still not sensitive enough. But what was quite interesting was that after two months, uh, those that have been positive became negative. So it might be a test of cure. Wouldn't that be great? And this is Claudia Mullins at the CDC, and she's, de she's developed a test that, uh, based on the metabolites, the lipids and proteins, and other markers in the blood that's 88% sensitive in early Lyme disease and correctly differentiated Lyme from other diseases that are similar, like chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. So that's pretty interesting and exciting, and uh, it takes a lot of technology to do metabolomics. So I asked her recently, I said, is this really a realistic test? That's something that people will be able to use, uh, and then, you know, and you can develop into a hospital-based test, and, sh and apparently there are people working on the technology now to make that possible. Okay, so there's lots of causes as to why people have persistent symptoms, right? You, it could be that you have a small amount of persistent infection that's still revving up your system. It could be that you have an unrecognized co-infection. It could be that you have uh, changes in your brain, neural network dysregulation as a result of the uh, 
previous infection or ongoing infection. It could be that your immune system has gotten dysregulated. So depending on what the cause is, that will shape the treatment approach. And certain, at different phases of the disease, it might be persistent infection early on, and then you retreat it, and the person gets better. But then the antibiotics no longer may be working, and then you need to try another approach. And it could be immune modulation for some people who might have a peripheral neuropathy who might benefit from IVIG, or it could be uh, brain network changes. So another advance is that repeated antibiotic therapy has been shown to help persistent fatigue, and that's one of the problems, biggest problems that patients complain about. Uh, so at least in a study that we did and Stony Brook did, that's what was shown. Um, and the good news actually was that in the recent NICE guidelines, which came out of Britain, uh, they acknowledged that this was an important finding from Lauren Krupp's study that repeated antibiotic treatment could help um, with the persistent fatigue. Dr. Fallon, did, did you ascertain why? Why did they get better? Why did antibiotics help uh, with the fatigue? Uh, well, my assumption is that the antibiotics helped with fatigue because they had a small amount of persistent infection. But what's in, what was interesting about that study was it was biased towards failure, that study, because we recruited, it's not like I was trying to do a failed study, I wanted to do a successful study, but um, we enrolled patients who we didn't, we didn't place any limit on the amount of prior antibiotic that they had. So we had on average seven months of prior oral antibiotics and two months of prior IV antibiotics. So these people had been robustly treated, right? And to think that they would get better from a second or third course of IV antibiotics I hoped it was going to be true, and I was hoping that their main improvement would be in cognition, so it didn't actually. Cognition, they got better somewhat, but then they lost all their gains, so it really wasn't helpful uh, on a sustained basis, but the fatigue improvement was helpful. And what I learned from that study was that the primary problem with our Lyme patients is not really, I mean, you do have brain fog, you do have some cognitive slipping, but the real problem is the profound exhaustion and fatigue that people have, as well as the pain. So that patients who, who or pe people who design studies in the future, at least if I were designing one, I would focus on either the fatigue or the pain. But you also were saying that, so after giving them that next round of antibiotics. They got better, and now the question is, they, the pain also got better, uh, but not in everybody, right? It's only, a, it's only a portion of patients, but it was more so than with placebo. Um, so I would say that, well, actually the data showed that about 60% of patients got better with the fatigue, not like 100% better, but meaningfully better, and, uh, but that meant 40% didn't. So we need to figure out what to do with that 40%. It was, it was, it, we did 10 weeks of IV just because we were trying to do something longer than what they had previously had, and most people had previously had four weeks or three weeks. So there was no magic to the four weeks. Lauren Krupp, when she did her study at Stony Brook, she only did four weeks, and she found her, we replicated the same exact results she had. So I, I'm not, I don't actually think 10 weeks is the magic number. I think four weeks is a good number. Uh, The other thing, we did a long-term follow-up study, and patients who had been in that study reported that they actually did very well in the long term, the majority of patients. So that was very encouraging as well. So who are these two people? Ying Zhang is at Hopkins. He's one of the world experts on tuberculosis and how to treat refractory TB. Kim Lewis is one of the world experts on the treatment of persister bugs as well. He's at Northeastern. And the two of them are applying their brilliant brains to studying uh, Lyme disease and persister bugs, persister Borrelia, and how to kill them. And I can tell you, I can't give you the details, but I can tell you that they're coming up with really great stuff, which is uh, absolutely amazing, actually. Um, and uh, it's going to make our lives a lot better. Uh, Rafael Tokars is at Columbia, and he's developed a, something called the Ciro chip, the tick Ciro chip that detects um, the, all these different organisms inside the, inside the tick. 
Okay, so this is a fancy slide, but really the main point is that we did a study of the spinal fluid of, to see if it's different in Lyme patients versus chronic fatigue syndrome patients, and yes, it is different. So they're not the same diseases. There actually are differences. We looked at brain blood flow and showed that there are some areas of reduced blood flow in the brains of these of patients with chronic Lyme symptoms. Um, we're, we're doing a study trying to see if human brains, people who have donated their brains after um, or put it in their will that they wish to donate their tissues uh, at whatever time they die. And so if it's in their will, and then we get a call saying, oh, my relative really wanted to donate her brain or his brain. And so we've gotten some brains over the last, um, not too many, over the last uh, several years. And now we're looking in those brains to see if we can find spirochetes. Um, we may not, most likely we won't, but we might. And the part, who's doing it? Who's doing this research? Not me because I don't know about how to find spirochetes, but Monica Embers, who is that wonderful monkey researcher. So we're collaborating with her, and she's doing the research. And I'll land up at Columbia, who's a colleague of mine, is studying using brain imaging uh, that what's called central sensitization, or brain pain, which is the hyperactivated pain networks that patients with Lyme disease, we think, have. And if we can show that they're hyperactivated, then we may be able to also show that we can reduce that hyperactivation and help patients. So what about vaccines? Are there any vac? Would you like a vaccine? Who would like a vaccine? Some do. Raise your hand if you'd like a vaccine. Who does not want a vaccine? OK. So some people are quite scared of vaccines. Others are very interested in vaccines. Um, so there are some new vaccines in development. Uh, there's a new OSPE vaccine, which is based on the old vaccine, but it's, it has the uh, areas taken away that supposedly were causing the arthritis or triggering the neurologic problems. There's an OSPC vaccine, which Richard Marconi down at Virginia Commonwealth University uh, is working on, and that recently came out for dogs. So those dogs have another great vaccine, but we humans don't have it yet. But that's very exciting. Then there's, uh, you want me to go back so you can take a picture of that? <laughs> I saw it, I removed it too quickly. OK. Um, then there's uh, this whole idea of what about if the mice that carry the spirochetes, if the mice don't have the spirochetes, then the ticks can't get infected. And if the ticks can't get infected, then you can't get infected, right? So how do we get the mice so that they no longer have the spirochetes? Well, one way to do that is to um, genetically modify the mice. Well, how do you genetically modify a mice? Well, there's this new technology called CRISPR, and it enables the researchers to do this. And then they can have this dominant mice mouse that then populates and takes over an island. So all the mice will then have to carry this dominant gene that generates antibodies against the Lyme spirochete. So the mice cannot have the spirochete inside of them. And so all of a sudden, you have all these mice that all of a sudden become your friend instead of your enemy. And those mice uh, no longer carry the Borrelia organism. So Kevin Esfeld, a young researcher at MIT, is doing that exciting work. And the island of Nantucket is very interested in this. And um, uh, they're supporting it, supporting the project. And if it's successful on an island, then it might spread uh, those, they might spread those mice to the mainland. And then we'll have these mice going all around the United States. You have a nice island here, yes. So Staten Island would be another great place. So if it works in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, then you'll take it here. And then there's another good thing which is going to be on the market in another six or eight months. Uh, it's um, a mouse vaccine. So how do you vaccinate the mouse? You have them eat this acorn-sized bait. Uh, the mouse then gets vaccinated. The ticks can't suck up the spirochetes from the mouse because the spirochetes aren't there because the mouse has been vaccinated. Fewer infected ticks mean fewer infected patients. So that actually is uh, coming out very soon with uh, US biologics. So we know prevention is the key. That's going to be the answer. And then when patients, uh, when people, when I talk to doctors, I like to give this one, what is the patient's experience? Because doctors don't necessarily understand the patient's experience. The patients know it, uh, but the doctors may not. And there's Edward Munch's beautiful painting, Sensory Hyperarousal, and you know, light and sound are just too much, and so they have to cover their ears and their eyes. And then William Blake, the great uh, illustrator, artist, and um, 
uh, illustrated the Bible, and he has this one picture here of Job being accused by his neighbors of, of having committed some sin, and that's why you're so sick, because you committed some sin. So it's like that's what patients with Lyme disease are accused of, that they did it to themselves. So I, I'm just going to finish with this brief little story of Sally, a 10-year-old girl with abrupt onset OCD. I know, uh, I know Bob is going to talk about OCD, but I thought I would just present this one case. She went to bed okay, woke up the next day crying. Something's wrong with my head. I can't stop it. It was completely sudden onset. She was hospitalized in an inpatient psychiatric facility uh, because she was so terrified of germs. And literally, she was fine one day and woke up the next day. She was like possessed. Um, and lo and behold, she had had numerous embedded ticks. She came from an, uh, an endemic area. Uh, she did not recall a Lyme rash or joint pain, so she didn't have any of the typical signs of Lyme disease, but she did have some subtle paresthesias, which is numbness and tingling. She did have a decline in her vision. Um, and sometimes strep can induce this, sudden onset OCD after strep infection, so they checked her for strep, but strep, strep studies were negative. So what did they do? Treat her with antibiotics, right. So the psychiatrist said, okay, we're not gonna treat her with psychiatric meds, cause, so let's stop the tiny little dose we gave her and put her on uh, antibiotics. Her Lyme tests were very highly positive. Her C6 ELISA was six, which is super high. Western blot was positive on IgM and IgG. She was like, this is the trifecta, I guess, the, the perfect, perfect result for in terms of positive test results. Um, and she got 14 weeks of antibiotics and a little, little bit of cognitive behavior therapy weekly, and she did splendidly, so 90% better in uh, just three to four weeks, three to four months. Uh, so she no longer avoided food or restrooms, no longer repeats and rereads, cognition and vision and penmanship normalized, and she became a happy girl again. So it's nice to have those stories, but the problem is, other than Dr. Visconti, who's like one of the few wonderful human beings, doctors in the whole world who treats these children uh, as well as adults, there are very few uh, pediatricians who uh, are available to work with these patients. And so I'm happy to say that uh, Dr. Vargas, the person in the middle here, is a pediatric neurologist at Columbia who's very interested in new onset uh, neuropsychiatric disorders after infection. Could be strep, could be Lyme, it could be other infections. And Dr. Delaney on the, on the left there is, is a child psychiatrist who I recently hired to work with me. She's fantastic. And Dr. Uh, Agalyu on the right is uh, a neuroscientist, and he's studying how is it that the blood-brain barrier is compromised and that these antibodies are crossing the blood-brain barrier. So he's a hardcore scientist with NIH grants, and so he's very involved in this uh, pediatric neuropsychiatry <coughs> outreach program. So it's, it's, uh, that's, that's really exciting. So is there reason for hope? Yep, there is, and if you want to read more, go to the book, Conquering Lyme Disease. Uh, and thanks to everybody who have helped as patients or as donors uh, and from our team. And we have a new website that we just uh, put up about a month ago, columbia-lime.org. Um, so take a look at it and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Fallon. Um, being a patient and this being my first shot at a conference, I didn't properly introduce uh, Dr. Fallon, but he is the director of Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Research for the Columbia University Medical Center. He also is a great contributor to uh, our advocacy in helping us find the information we need.